this is what we call the early bird special, y'all. This is the, this is gonna be the early bird blessing right here. Everybody ain't gonna get in on it cause they not here, so we, it's gonna be this gonna be the early bird blessing for everybody. Pray you all have had a good week so far, and the start of this week, I I pray it's gonna be just as well. Yeah. As we continue our study here, we are in the book of Romans. We're looking at ver chapter 12, verse 16. And we're going to be looking at our text and what we consider same-mindedness. In Romans 12 and 16, Paul declared that we are to be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. In this particular text of scripture, Paul now is giving a last set of instructions again to the believers of the church. He's dealing with the church in, in Romans and he's giving us a last set of instructions as believers. And in this particular set, we found out that we should be of the same mind the text teaches us. It says we should actually have a harmonious spirit. Then it actually comes about and it tells us that it emphasizes the fact that Christians in the congregation ought to be on one accord. And then we talked about we should have the same philosophy, our purpose should be the same, and we should all do it with a mutual love and respect. Now, out of this teaching, Paul repeats his admonition out of Romans 15 and 5, and he told us as brothers in the congregation and in the church how we should actually pull together and, and, and how we should deal with one another. So he gave us that idea, and he was teaching us that. And last week when we dropped off it, we was dealing with the idea that believers is to, under, to understand that other person such a, in such a degree that he can completely identify and feel with that particular person. So out of that whole concept what Paul was dealing with there was, he was saying is we should know each other, we should be able to deal with each other, relate to each other as believers in a congregation or a church. He actually closed it in and, and not actually dealing with the whole of Christianity, but right now he's dealing with the congregation or a congregational issue. We should be able to understand what he's talking about when I say congregational issues, which he's talking about the church or this church in general. So this week, we're gonna pick up on our second point. Now last week, the first point we started out was is, the believer is to be of the same mind. This week, we're going to look at our second point where the believer is told, do not put your mind on high things. Amen? Now, if you bow our heads, we're going to have a prayer, and then we're going to get started. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for your protection of last night's sleep and slumber, and we thank you for making us arise to this brand new day. We thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. We thank you, God, for the protection and all the healing powers that you have and you've given us. Even those we don't even aware that you've done for us, we just want to say thank you for being the great God that you are. Now, Father, as we study this, your word, we pray, Father, that you speak to us in a way that is, is plain and simple and understanding in our spirit. We pray that you, 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 you just take our spirit and, and, and just anoint it in a way that we can walk in a walk that shows that we're understanding your word and that we're living a life that's pleasing in thy sight. We thank you for the house. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the families. And most of all, we just want to bless each and every one at the sound of my voice and those that hear your word, that you bless us in a way that we can be the people that you called us to be. And then we can be ever so careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory. For it's Jesus' name we ask it all. Let every heart say amen. The second point we want to start out here, out of the text of Scripture of Romans 12 and 16, is that this right here. It said, believers, the believer is told something. The believer is actually told, do not set your mind on high things, Romans 12 and 16b. The issue is, Paul is dealing with the mind because the mind has the power to bring life or bring destructions because everything starts with a thought. So how you think determines how you live. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines the mindset as a mental attitude or inclination, a fixed 
state of mind. So a mindset is a result of our predominant thoughts that form attitudes, it impacts emotions, and are displayed by either a positive or a negative behavior. So when Paul says in Romans 12 and 16b, do not, don't set your mind on high things, the phrase indicates that we're to have a humble spirit or a humble spirit is required. Now, think about this. We dealt with humility once before, and it's coming up again because this is one of the important points that we need to look at. It says, we have to have a humble spirit, or a humble spirit is required. In Philippians 2, verses 3 through 4, this is what was said. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, in that particular text of scripture, and I'm sure you didn't see it on the, on the screen because I just thought about it a moment ago. In that text of scripture, Paul was dealing with selfish ambitions, or in other words, he's talking about the pride, your pride. Then he speaks of having conceit. In other words, your pursuit of personal glory or gain. And then he came back and said, we should establish a lowlessness of mind. And that means the idea of being humble. And then, of course, he says, esteem others better than himself, which means the basic definition of humility. I said that to let you understand this. A humble spirit is when you have surrendered yourself totally to the power of the Holy Spirit to teach and to guide you. To be humble means this, we turn our life over to God and for God to rule us and for God to teach us and for God to guide us. Amen. One of the biggest issues is I don't think we understand humility or what it means to have a humble spirit. When you humble yourselves, you make yourselves low. And when I say low, it doesn't mean that you are lesser than a person again. It means that you're surrendering your power over to someone. And this someone that we're surrendering power to is God. We're giving God all power. In other words, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're turning your power over to God. It's no longer you or you running what you do. It's all in God's hand, where it should be if you belong to him. Because if he's the one that guides your life and going to guide you, then we have to learn to submit our will to him, give him his power, turn over everything to him. And that's the major issue with Christians today is we're Christians, but we want to run things. See, I want to be a Christian, but I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to, I don't want to give power to God. I just want him to take over the big stuff. I don't want him to take over my whole life. And he can't work like that. He has to have all of you or none of you. And the issue Paul is trying to get the Roman church to understand as well as us today is, he's saying, when you, when you give your life to Christ, when you submit to him, you have to give him all of it. Because he can't work in your life with part of you. See, I can't, I can't fix you when I only got part of you or when you're only submitting part of yourself to me. I need all of you or none of you. So he wants us to understand that. He says this right here. He says, we have to have a humble spirit. There's no way possible that you can be a Christian without Christ. There's no way it can happen. In other words, he's, he's the empowering factor in life. Without Christ in our lives, we're just like the world. We're the Gentile world. He has to be in our lives. He has to control us, and he has to operate in us. So when he says this, he says we have to hum have a humble spirit. It's going to be required for us to actually not to even set our minds on high things. Have you ever found yourself getting full of yourself and start thinking you're running things? Yeah. Have, you ever, have you ever had things that start going good, and it looked like you were doing it, well, really, it wasn't you. I mean, you thought you made a wise decision or you thought you made a wise choice and all, and all essence is it wasn't you. And see, that's what he's saying is we have to be careful and we have to understand who we are and give God or credit what credit do. Because God has taught us in Scripture he's not going to share his, he's not going to share glory with nobody. Not you, me, or anybody. So if you think you're running things, he's going to take his hands off of you. And then see how well it works out for you then. 
See, but, and that's what we have to figure out. And Paul is trying to get the, 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 the church in Romans, he was trying to get them to understand this. When you surrender to Christ, surrender all the way to him, not partially. Give him everything you got. Let him have your life. And, and, and I know as, as people, we like to think that we don't want to put too much on God. I don't want to burden him too much. I don't want him to have to be bothered with this little trivial stuff. I can handle that if you just handle the big stuff, God. But in essence, he's there for everything because the smallest of decisions can be a big old problem. So we have to learn to incorporate him in everything. So when Paul was writing to the church, he wanted them to understand. He says, don't set your mind on high things. Be careful what you're doing. Now, he was saying that for a reason that he wanted us to understand. In Romans 12, 16b, when Paul says high things, he refers to the, the seeking of the things or the seeking of things of preeminence, seeking of the things of honor, prestige, recognition. That's what he's talking about. In other words, it's when you feel yourself all puffed up and you want to run things. That's what he's talking about. We just gave you, I gave you a quick synopsis of that a minute ago. When you think you're doing good, when you, when the, when, when you decide to start making those six figures on your job, you start to making this money, now all of a sudden you think you're doing some things. Yeah. You think you're really all of that now. Yeah. And truth be told, you actually want people to look up to you because you're in a certain status now. And we thrive and live that way, although we may not say it, but we actually live that way. When you, when you get to a certain point in life and you start to be doing a certain way, driving a certain car, you want people to look up to you. You might not, you might not intentionally do it, but you actually do. And God says, be careful of that. Paul is trying to say, beware of that, beware of that particular lifestyle of what you're doing. When Paul says high things or refers to high things, when he says pre preeminence, he's talking about beware of being superior or thinking you're superior to others. See, superiority complex. A blessing will mess you up if you don't pay attention. If you, everybody can't handle a blessing. Because when God starts to bless you, sometimes you think it's you. You want to believe that you're the reason why you're blessed instead of that God chose to bless you or he called you to bless you. Christians, those of us that he's called into the kingdom of God, we think, we, we think that we're, we did something when we accepted Christ. But it was actually we answered a call that he called us. We didn't choose him. He called you. And when he called you, he called you for a purpose. But he calls you in a sense that you don't, you don't realize how blessed you are to be called where you're at. That's the part that should bother those who accepted him and then take it so lightly. Yeah. You accepted Christ. He brought you into the kingdom, given you eternal life. But now you want to treat him like he's a bellboy in a restaurant. You know when you need a drink, you call him and fill your glass back up. Or when you drop your silverware, we want to treat God that way. See, because we have got, we have to be careful because we'll get high-minded in our lifestyles. So he says, we got to be careful about that. And he says this, he says, preeminence was a problem, superiority. Then he says, honor. Yeah. Honoring, honoring. You know, we, he says, be careful about honoring and being honored. Those of us who want to be honored or be greater than who we are or looking up to people for who they are. See, we honor certain people, and Paul was dealing with the church at this time in Romans because he was writing a letter, and he was saying, be careful about honoring people in the church and treating other people less than those. Yeah. See, I treat you so good because you were actually a doctor in, uh, in the congregation, and, and you make six figures, and you drive a Porsche, and you do all of that, so I treat you better. Yeah. Everybody knows your name in the church. Everybody speaks to you. Everybody come to you. But bruh bro Shelley, they work on the cars and dirty and grease and they ain't got too many clothes that don't look like that. Don't nobody know who I am. See, that's what, that's what, that's what he's basically saying. We're splitting people and, dry, and dividing people up because of status. He says, don't honor people because of who, what they got and what they have because we're all the same under Christ. So the idea, he says, be careful of preeminence, be careful of honor, and then be careful of prestige. Prestige. Now, now we, 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 people show, we show prestige and we, we give people an honor that they don't really deserve. Yeah. Because basically, you're just like me in the, in, the, in the sight of God. You're all my children. 
You're all my little nappy head children on the planet Earth. You're all trouble. You all done gave me trouble, and I'm having problems with each and every one of you. A lot of people don't know it, but I'm having trouble with every one of you. He said, so you all down there thinking one better than the other one, treating him better than you treat the other, and he's just as bad as you are. So he's trying to get us to understand the Roman church. Paul was writing a letter back to them, telling them, be careful, be very careful with this condition. Reason why? Because this this act right here is what divides churches or tears Christianity up. We tear churches up because we treat some better than others. You'll be surprised how many people have been in this church and now hadn't came back because of that reason. Because of how they were looked at when they came or how they were treated. I've heard stories, I've heard stories, the pastor talked about one time when he was at his church up north, and he said a man came off the street and had been having him some happy drinks. And he sat in the back. And of course, the church he said it was was one of those well-to-do First Baptist churches, so they immediately go to him because, you know, you can't come in here like that. And so they approached him like that, and that sometimes will set a, a barrier for people when, they, when things like that happen to them. And, and here's the issue. One or two people can cause the whole church to get the black eye. You ever heard people run around talking about, I've got church hurt before? And truly and honestly, it's not church hurt, it's people hurt. Somebody hurt you, the church didn't hurt you. Because you poll everybody and see that everybody have something to do with it, or was it one or two people that did it? But we all have to take the black eye because of what one or two may do. So he says, when we do that and we separate like that, we cause the problem. Now, here's the deal. If we're all on the same mind and the same accord, we're actually supposed to step in when that issue takes place. I should step in if I see something going wrong in the church or somebody saying something not right to somebody or somebody treating someone in a higher position better than the other. In other words, it's because Rev. Moss sitting right here on the front and everybody knows Rev. Moss and stuff like that, I still got Chief Deacon Brooke the same way. See, because he's a minister of the gospel, don't mean he's more than this man right here. You see what I'm saying? But what do we do in the churches? People with titles, we treat them a certain way. That's why people want titles. They don't want the title to do the work. They want the title because of the prestige to go along with it. So now we got people that jockeying for titles and jockeying for things to do just so they can have the prestige. A bit more God ain't called them than they did Mighty Mouse. But they want it because of the prestige. And Paul's saying, be careful with this, trying to get all this prestige for people to treat you a different way. Or are you treating them a different way because of who they say they are? Well, 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 here's the thing, here's the thing. He says, recognition, prestige, all of those acts, he said you have to be careful of and watch out for when we deal with each other. He said because it can set the church in a motion of a down spiral. So, he says this. He says, this actually means keeping one's mind upon high society, high positions, affluence, and all of these things that he's saying we're not we're to watch out for is a simple thing that the enemy slips into the world that's got us all perplexed. Now, on the outside in the world, those who have and those who have not, we live different neighborhoods, we live a different way. But in God's eyesight, we're all the same. Now, Paul was dealing here with his church in Romans. He's trying to, he's trying to get us to understand, don't treat any others different. I want you all same-minded. He started out, he said, we're supposed to be same-mindedness, thinking the same way, operating the same way, believing the same way. Then secondly, he came about and he started telling us, now he's saying this, not only are you to be same-mindedness, now I want you to actually not to, how to, how to treat people and how to, how, to, how, to, how, to low, how to, how to treat people of low estate and people of high regard. I want you now to not only speak the same, talk the same, but I want you to act the same. That issue is the problem is, is because most of us who we look up to that have things, we adopt what they do. 
You ever notice how people always gravitate and imitate those who have? The people who have money, the people who are influenced. The lowly, the, the poor want to be like the rich. We want to turn around and try to buy the homes they buy. We want to buy the cars they buy. And we're going to the poor house doing it. They make the money to do it. We don't. So what he's saying is this. He's saying this. One of the reasons why he's trying to break that habit so we learn to keep everybody on the same level and understand that all our honor and all our glory goes to God and God only. Because if I start giving you prestige and honor, then I'm taking away from God, giving it to you. See, I'm, I'm looking at like you doing something so special or you're that special that I'm treating you special in the house of God, and you're not. You're not. In the kingdom, we are all his children. Every one of us. And, and, and you want to hear something funny? I was, I, was, I, was, I was reading a story the other day, and I was, it was reading about a, about a preacher, and they were talking about him when he go to heaven. He says, well, when he go to heaven, he's going to be unemployed. He says, when he get to heaven, he's going to be unemployed. He said, because I ain't going to need to tell you about God because you're going to be with him. He says, so I ain't going to have, I'm going to be unemployed. He says, my job ends when, when it's over here. He said, my job is over with. I done done everything I was supposed to do. I brought the gospel, taught the gospel to his people, and now when I go or they go, my job is over with. So when I get to heaven, he said, I'm going to be unemployed. I'm going to have to look for some work. Why do you think he always give you a second type, give you something to do so you have something to do when you get there? Paul was a tent maker, so I guess Paul will be making tents in heaven. So think about it. Listen to what he says. Here's a quote I want you to hear right quick. It says this, selfish ambition will always kill the possibilities of harmony in the church and is the very opposite of the submissive spirit required for real Christian service. You, you think about it. Think about what he just said. Think about what I just read to you. Selfish ambition. Selfish ambition, that means me wanting to shine. My, 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 my ambitions to want to be something that I'm not. That right there will always kill my possibilities of harmony. What selfish ambitions does is it separates me from you. Because of my selfish ambitions, I'm trying to be all I can be and treat you like you less than me. See, for someone to be on top, somebody got to be on the bottom. So if I'm striving to be on top, I got to put you on the bottom. So he says, this selfish ambition will kill the possibilities of what? Harmony. Remember what we said harmony is? Being in tune with one another. We can't be in tune with one another as long as I'm trying to be better than you. But not only that, he didn't stop right there. Here's the part I really want you to understand. And we started out there, and I'm going to take you back here again. It says that. Here's the deal. It says the submissive spirit requires for real Christian service. This word submissive spirit we brought back around again. That means the surrender of yourself to Christ. The surrendering of your spirit allows God to operate in your life, allow God to lead you and put you in your rightful place, and more than anything, put your mind in the right position. Remember, we're dealing with the mind. When you have a submissive spirit, now God can deal with your mind. He can't deal with your mind as long as you think you're running things or you have your own agenda over here. And what we do is, I have my agenda and I'm operating on my agenda, so Sunday I'm going to be submissive to God, but Monday I'm in control again. Some of us don't wait till Monday. Some of us wait till Sunday at 12.05. Oh, well, wait a minute. 12.35 when you get through and the benediction go, it's back me now. I was with the Lord at first, but now I got an agenda. I'm trying to get somewhere in life. You ever notice when you leave here, you don't take nothing with you that you got? Matter of fact, you don't even get the, your family barely can keep the house that you had because you'll usually lose it. Unless they want to keep paying that note because you most likely hadn't paid it off. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. The submissive spirit is required for real Christian service. Until you learn to submit to God and turn yourself over to him, you can't fully serve the church or serve the kingdom of God. Why? Because in your mind, it's about you. 
Why do you think we have so much trouble getting people to operate, work in churches? I ain't saying just this church. I'm saying all churches. Why do you think we have so much trouble getting people to operate in churches? Because we don't want to submit to God. We don't want to submit to authority. We don't want to submit to God's natural authority. We have trouble submitting in the family the way God wrote the plan to be. He said, he said, wives submit to the husband, children submit to the wives. We have trouble with that. We ain't figured that out yet. We can't get that right. And he's taught us submission don't make you less. You're not less of a person when you submit and follow God's plan. If you follow God's plan, you can't go wrong. But our thought and our issue is if I submit, I'm weak. Or if you're in the street, you're a punk. Your old punk right there, everybody tell you what to do. You just do what everybody say do. And that's what he's saying. That's the issue that we're dealing with. We got to learn to get ourselves or learn how to be submissive. Learn to be submissive. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 1 and 2 what we should do. Paul talks to us in Colossians, and now he's laying out, here's the, here's the key. Here's one of the keys right here, what you got to do. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Amen. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Yeah. Mm. He just gave us a list that we should be dealing with. He just got through explaining, quit worrying about the world and what we're doing down here. Yeah. Quit trying to have and trying to get a position down here because this position is going to go away. Amen. You might be on top, but it don't never last down here. He said, the position you better be worried about is the one up above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, what you doing, where you wanna, what you want to look good in front of men down here, he said, be careful of that. For one thing, men will praise you today and talk about you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, they won't even wait till tomorrow, bro, Brooks. They'll praise you now and 15 minutes from now, they'll be talking about you. They did Jesus Christ that way, so what's the difference? Can you imagine Christ healing, opening the eyes of the blind, and then they start talking about him after he did it? Watch this, watch this, watch this. Set your mind on things above. What that means? We got to start learning the kingdom agenda. We got to understand what God wants for us and how he wants us to live and what he's trying to prepare us for. Understand this, if he's preparing us for kingdom living, then we got a lot of learning to do because a lot of us are slipping. Because yeah, yeah. we ain't getting it right down here, so how you going to operate in a kingdom is perfect and we can't live in an imperfect world? Yeah. Set your mind on high things above, not on things of the earth. What this stuff is on the earth, he said, don't let it bother you. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't let this get you down. He said, because this don't count. He promised us this going to pass away. He said this is going to go. So what do we do? We got to start looking above, looking at God's agenda, finding out what God wants for us. Now, you're going to hear probably later on. You're going to hear some of this maybe later on in another series that pastor going to probably teach you later on today. But you got to understand this. To learn God's agenda, we got to learn how to follow God. Right. See, until you learn to follow him, you don't know his agenda and you can't do his agenda. See, we don't, we don't know how to follow nobody. We don't know how to follow. See, when we was kids, they was trying to teach us when they started playing follow the leader. But we didn't even do that right. So now here it is later, we done got grown and we still don't want to follow the leader. We can't even walk behind each other. You got to go around each other and we won't follow instructions. We won't do nothing they tell us to do. But that's going to be so important for us as believers, learning how to follow. You got to learn how to follow God. You got to learn how to follow him in a way that you got to learn out what he wants in life. Most people sit there and say all the time, God, what's your will for my life? I need to know your will for my life. We don't understand. He put it in his word. He wrote it out in the first book. of it, if, you do, if you do Genesis, the first two chapters of Genesis will tell you God's will. First two chapters of Genesis, and then if you look at the last two chapters of Revelation, it'll give you God's will for us. But we sit there and say, God, what's your will? Then he tell you to do it, and then we still won't do it. 
We ain't obedient, don't know how to be obedient, and don't want to be obedient. We want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. That's why Paul was having so much trouble with the church, because they were actually started listening to the outside. It was amazing. When you first come to Christianity, you'd be gung-ho, fired up for church. But Lord, the door's open and you'll be here. And the longer you get in Christianity, the more you start falling off doing less and less. That's why so many churches allow people to do things when they first come in because that's when they want to do it when they first join. Yeah. I want to get into a ministry. I want to join the choir. You'll do all that when you first get here. Yeah. Stay here six months. You'll barely come. Yeah. 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 And churches, and, 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 and here's the key, and, and, and it's been brought up here, and we deal with it here, and we have to deal with it the way we deal with it, but when you join church, we first got to sit you down and make sure you, you catch up where we are. It's called new members class, but it actually we got to make sure you where you need to be before you start joining and do something. What good is you doing things and you ain't ready to do things yourself? I got you singing in the choir and you living like hell. And you standing up there just praising God down and you the biggest devil everywhere else. So he's saying is this. We got to set our minds on things up above and then follow those things that you set your mind on. We know what God's saying, but you won't do it. He's not going to force you. I'm going to give you a news flash. God ain't forcing nobody to do what they don't want to do. Because he said is, you ain't got a seat on the train if you don't want to do what you're supposed to do. The train will just chug right on along and leave you right where you at. So here's the deal, here's the deal. Setting your mind on things up above is one of the keys we have to make sure we understand when we're dealing with setting our mind or, or beware of high things or the text, what text is teaching us. Don't set your mind on high things. Don't think about things of the world all the time, trying to be rich, trying to have all these jobs, trying to make all this money, and then putting Christ second. And it's funny how we pray to God for jobs, we pray to God for money. Then when he bless us and give it to us, we pray God second. You pray for this business. God, if you let me get this business, I'll be there every week. Then next thing you know, you open on Sunday. God ain't going to give you no job that's going to take away from him. He ain't going to put you on no job where you got to work on those during Sunday. Setting your mind on things up above means that we got to, and, and, and I'm going to back up on that one because I got to. I'm sorry, Lord. Holy Spirit, say back up. Make sure they understand. A lot of the issues with that, t- that statement I just made was this. I say that God, God blesses you with a position. You get the position, and then you have to work on Sunday. Well, God allows that to happen sometimes to see where you're going to be. Or you're going to stand up for the word of God and say, look, I took this job, but I need to be off on Sundays. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes he put it on you to make sure to see where you at. Are you greedy for the money and the things of the world? Are you more worried about the kingdom agenda? See, because when you go to them and tell them that, their jobs will make a condition for you if you are who they want. See, if you what you say you are and they hired you for this position, they'll make an adjustment for you. But you got to step up and tell them that. It's amazing, and you'll be, it's amazing how it happened. And I've seen it happen in action, and I'm, I'm listening to my amen corner because I know what happened now. And I got one up in the balcony, worked their second shift at the police department, and her cohort sitting down there drinking out this cup right now while I'm teaching her. That joker working second shift and used to leave to come to Bible study and go back to work. And could not, her time took more to get here and do Bible study and get back. Her time was up, but they never, they didn't do nothing to her about it. They let her do it. Now, it was nothing she did. It was favor from God for being obedient. And our problem is, is we don't get that blessing because we ain't obedient. So we want to sit back and pray and want to wonder about things of the earth and scramble and scuffle and try to get it ourselves instead of praying to God, following his agenda, and watch him bless you. See, because he going to bless you his way when you stand up for the kingdom. We don't follow the kingdom agenda, so he ain't blessing. 
God's sitting on healing. God's sitting on blessing. He says, he says the wealth of the wicked are laid up for the poor. We can't collect it because we ain't doing what we're supposed to do. We're too busy trying to do it our way, get it our way, and a lot of times it ain't for us to have. Be careful of the selfish ambition. Be careful of selfish ambition and always, always get a submissive spirit. Get a submissive. If you don't do nothing, if you ain't figured out nothing yet out of all of this, the key point I want you to understand is develop a submissive spirit. Learn how to submit to the power of God. When God speak, when God call on you, learn to hear his voice and learn to move when he call on you. We won't move when he call us and not moving is a lack of faith. When you got to think about it and ask 15 people about it, that's the issue. That means you don't know him. Lord say jump, jump. When you don't jump, what he's saying is you don't know my voice. And if you don't know my voice, he said, you must not be mine. He said in the scripture, my children know my voice. So if you hear him and you know him, you will do what he say do. So, 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 think about it, think about it, think about it. Remember I said be submissive, be very submissive, learn to be submissive. Paul just got through explaining in Colossians 3 and 1 that we got to learn to look to heaven, look to God for our blessings, look to God for what we need. The world is the world, and it'll treat you like the world. You'll, make a, you'll have a good job today, and tomorrow you'll get laid off. And it can lay you off sometime that you won't even get to come back. And it ain't thinking about family, it ain't thinking about children, it ain't thinking about homes, house notes, car notes, or none of that. Well, 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 here's the thought, here's the thought. So this right here, listen closely, listen closely. Since Colossians 3.12 told us what we should do, he says, clearly the things are above of Colossians 3 and the high things of Romans 12 and 16 are not the same. Romans 12 and 16 says, do not set your mind on things, high things in the world. Stay away from it. Colossians says, reach to the things from up above and get your blessing. Worldly stuff is not going not to last. How many people that you know that had worldly things went, went, went away and they still got them? No, no, no Brinks trucks follow the hearse to the cemetery. You got to be lucky if they let you go in there with your gold teeth. Because the grave diggers the last one see you and they're going to pull them gold out your mouth. Putting all them watches and rings on their finger. Believe me, somebody waiting to take that out before they put that box in the ground. This man had this fine home. Now he's gone. He didn't live a life, didn't live a righteous life on earth. He, had a, he lived like he wanted to on earth. Now he's going to a place where righteousness is, and he don't qualify to be there because he didn't live for up above. Or better than that, here's the hurting part. A believer who has salvation doesn't lose his salvation because he lived bad, because he didn't do the things, but now his blessings upstairs are not going to match where he's going. In other words, he goes, I was on top when I was down here. When I go up there, I'm going to be on the bottom. I had all the prestige when I was on earth. Everybody knew my name. Everybody spoke well of me. Then when I go to heaven, I'm in the field. Because there, there are rewards in heaven, believe it or not, if you don't know it is. See, don't think you're just going to get to go to heaven. Everybody's going to have the same thing. Wrong. If anybody told you that, they're shucking and jiving you. God has rewards for those who have worked diligently in the kingdom and did what they were supposed to do. So if you wasn't doing that, you might better learn to get your mind on things up above and start doing something for the kingdom. Because God said, if you ain't want to work for me down here, ain't nothing to get nothing up there. You're just going to be what they call a seat filler when you get to heaven. I'm just going to have a spot for you to, to hang out at and, and hopefully you'll learn how to say praise the Lord, hallelujah. 
Because you got, you got to learn that because that's what we're going to be doing 24-7, praising God. If you ain't mastered that on earth, what, what, what good are you going to be in heaven? You can't praise him here. How you going to praise him now? This is the class to learn how to praise him. Don't let me get too far off track, y'all. Stop me, stop me, stop me. So listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Hmm. Since there are direct parallels, Colossians 3 and 12 and Romans 12 and 16, here's the deal. So the high thing refers to the honor before men, material riches. Honor before men. The high things that he's talking about, 12 and 16, is the honor before men, material riches. Honor before men. Hey, don't. We struggle all our lives to look good in front of people who don't matter to us. busting my chops to look good for some people who don't care nothing about me and don't know nothing about me and can't affect my salvation, can't get me into heaven, can't get me into hell. They can help me get to hell, but they can't get me in there. Now, they can add to my trip to hell because they can talk me into doing some foolishness, but that's all. Material wealth, material things. I want to have all this. I want to have, I want to be on top of the world. And then I can't get in hell. Mm. Oh, but don't stop there, don't stop there, don't stop there. Watch this one right here then. Since the high things refers to honor before men, before men. Be careful when you're doing things just to be seen of men. Because that reward is different. We talked about that a minute ago. Men's honor will go quick. Men don't honor you long. They don't honor you long, especially if you go against them. Say something about them. Don't go along with them. Don't agree what they do. That honor leave you quick as it came. But instead, we're fighting to get this honor that this honor ain't going to stay with us. See, that's what the Pharisees was wanting to do. That's what they love, what is honor before men. Matthew 6 and 2 talks about that right there. Matthew 6 and 2 says this right here. It says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as you are, as the hypocrite do in the synagogues and in the streets. That they may have glory for men, assuredly I say to you, they have their reward. Look what he's saying going on here. You do things to give to people and want to be seen giving to people. You're doing it because you want a man's blessing. You want the world to look at you and talk about Oh, they so charitable. Look how much they gave. Look what they doing for everybody. Yeah. See, they want a reward from the world. Right. True givers don't care if you know they're giving. Right. Matter of fact, they give on the side there. They don't want nobody to see them give. They done learn the art of shake the hand and slide it to you because they don't want everybody to see them because they ain't worried about man seeing them doing it. Right. See, because... So who sees you in the, in the, in the, that the one that sees you sliding to him is the one in heaven. See, God see you when you give that way. Man see you when you give out in the open. Life application moment. When you give it out in the moment, God say, I ain't studying them jokers. They just want to be, they just want people to think they're giving to everybody. He should have gave more than that, God say. He, I gave him more than that. I blessed him with so much more. That's all he going to give. That's why he talked about the giving. When he talked about the widow gave out, gave out of what she had, she gave more than the ones that had all the money. They gave more money, but they didn't give out of their abundance. They gave $100, but they had $500. The widow gave two mice because that's all she had. She gave her all. Well, well, watch this. Watch this, watch this, watch this then. Paul here condemns an attitude of haughtiness. Paul condemns an attitude of haughtiness in Romans 11 and 20. He's now beginning to go back to the thought of the mind. He's dealing with the mind. The mind brings about the attitude. And he says this in Romans 11 and 20. Well said, because of the unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Do not be high-minded. Don't be high-minded in the world. Keep yourself of low degree. Keep yourself on a, on a level where God can lift you up. 
if you keep trying to put yourself up, God can't lift you up because you're already putting yourself somewhere. And I found out one thing. It's better for God to raise you up and you lift yourself up and God puts you down. Because if you elevate yourself and don't supposed to be there, you will get sent back down. But when God raises you up, ain't nobody to put you back down. And that's where, we've, that's where we have the issue with. Paul says this. He says, be careful of haughtiness. Be careful of wanting to be all of that. Be careful of wanting to stand and be, and be all you can be and, and letting the world see you do it. Sure, Bill Gates donate money, giving money to everybody, but he got a lot. How many times have you heard him giving it and don't nobody know where it came from? Or better than that, I had to learn in my giving. When I give, I thought this was a cliche, God bless you. I thought it was just a cliche, but I found out from Pastor, I gave some, I called him one time because I was kind of disturbed, and I gave some money to some people, and what I did was, I said, God bless you. And I had to, it, it bothered me, so I called Pastor one morning. This was a long time ago. I said, Pastor, I gave some money to a guy you know, on the street, and I helped him. He said, okay, what's your problem? I said, but I said, God bless you. He said, well, who else gave it to him? <laughs> Giving honor to whom honor is due. If you say God bless you to bless somebody, then it was God who did the giving. It wasn't yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And when you learn to give God his credit, God gives you more to give because you're operating like he wants you to operate. That takes you all the way back around the block again to what? Being submissive. When he tells you to do it and you give him the credit for what you did. See, in society, we found out or society tries to mold us to make us think that you're doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I am the one. In the kingdom of God, it's always God doing it. God is the key. God is the giver. God is the healer. Doctors are used by God. He put them on earth and then he operates through them. You see what I'm saying? Counselors, counselors, I ain't knocking counselors because God put them here to be a listening ear for some time for people. And what happens when they do it? They do the work of the kingdom of God. They godly listen. They godly know what to say and what not to say and when to say something. Here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal. We have to learn to set our minds on things up above so that we may be pleasing in God's eyesight. Paul goes on to tell us in Romans 12 and 16, he says, but associate with the humble. You can't associate with the humble if you're not humble. Have you ever seen somebody who think they all of that try to hang out with you and you ain't all of that? You can tell they just trying to, they're just trying to hang around. Most of the time you ask yourself, why are they coming around me? They must want something. Why are they hanging around me? Because the humble and those who consider themselves a high esteem can never hang together. Think about Jesus Christ. Think about Jesus Christ. He was among the people. Matter of fact, he was so much among the people when he was healing, a lot of times people are bumping all up against him. He had to say, who bumping up against me? Who thronging up against me? Because he was in the midst of them. He wasn't like the Pharisees standing back with all the bodyguards and everybody keeping them away from him. He was among his people. That's why I mind about Pastor Paul when I first met him years ago, besides him being shorter than me and I could tell him what to do. What I really mind about him was he was other people. This is one of the rarest churches you're going to find where the pastor, anybody can reach him and talk to him. And that joker would answer the door no matter who would now. He done learn better now, but anybody would come to that door, that joker would answer. And then trust to try to talk to you and fix your problem by himself in the hood. In the hood, talking to anybody come to the door, knock on the door. Yeah, man, what can I do for you? Man, close that door and ask through the door. It says we have to learn to associate with the humble. The idea is not that we should avoid associating with those of high portions of wealth and influence. We're not going to avoid them, but it's more to associate with the humble than it is with the rich. James 2, 2 through 8, number let us go. Or am I? I'm going to try. Listen to James 2, 2 through 8. 
For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should come also, there should come in a poor man, filthy rag or filthy clothes, huh? And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor, you stand up. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised? Mm. Those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the, the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, listen, 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 to what's, listen to what's going on. Listen to what's going on. A man came in New Horizon Baptist Church. Got some raggedy clothes. Look kind of bad there. Some say he kind of smelled a little bit there. He's looking kind of rough. Well, those of the greeting committee and those who are the ushers, they grabbed him and put him in a spot away from everybody else after they interrogated him and found out if he was going to come in here and do us harm. Yeah. Well, then here come another fella come in the door, and he had his rocks on. Rings, sky back there. I'm in the world sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, he had his rings on and stuff, and he come in, and the usher then brought him down to the front to a good spot in the church. God saying is, there's something wrong with that picture, ain't it, y'all? Why are you treating the one who got all the stuff on better than the one in the back and the one who got all the rings and stuff, he oppressing you too. He don't like y'all either. He just came in here for something, but he don't really like y'all. So why are you sitting up here treating him better and he talking about you, blaspheming your name, doing you dishonor, and you sitting up here acting like he the best thing to come in here? I'm going to take you back in the Hebrew days. Here's how the old church used to be set up. When they came to the church, it wasn't a lot of pews, it wasn't a lot of seats, and everybody had nowhere to sit down there. It was some benches across the wall. It might have been a couple of benches in the front, and everybody else squatted like the Indians and sat in the floor. Well, those, that had the, those who had the money and stuff like that, they got the good seats. Those who didn't have money, you sat in the dirt. And that's what he's saying. How you treat people because they got something during that day, the rich people treated the poor people like crap. So why are you paying so much attention to the rich and they the ones don't really like you too? We have more obligations to associate with the humble or the lowly and not because they are more important but because they are more needy. God says is this. You have an obligation to do the work of the kingdom of God by associating with those who are of need. People who got it all or think they got it all don't need you. The ones who ain't got it need you. And your obligation is to do the work of the kingdom of God, which is answering the call of the needy. See, we are to do the work of the kingdom when it says handling the needs of the world. Don't you understand? We are the ones that do it. God touches your heart. God touches your heart to do what he calls you to do. See, just like the man I helped, God touched me in my heart and said, give that man what you gave him in my name. See, he works through people. He works through people that are submissive to him that when he tell you to do it, you will do it. Now, some of us, he's asked you to do some things, and you say, you sure that's you, Lord? Prove to me that's you, Lord, and keep driving by the person that needs to help. And then get away and say, well, if I knew it was Lord, I would have went back and gave him something. So understand, be careful, keep this thought in your mind. You must learn to be submissive and obedient to God's word. Then and only then can you actually operate in Christianity like he called you to do. Thank you very kindly for life application. Next week, we'll pick up where we left our fit, and we'll, we'll pick up from there. Everybody all right so far? Did I hurt anybody's feelings? I didn't hurt nobody's feelings. You know what they said?
pastor told me one time, he says, you know, you ain't teaching unless you're hurting somebody's feelings. Somebody should have got an ouch about what you said. If everybody's doing good, that means y'all some good saints, so I didn't do a good job, one of the two. Good, good, I got one. Let's get ready for morning worship. So it's Felicia, the choir.
church, amen. Once again, we want to thank God for allowing us another opportunity just to be able to be in his house. And even if you entered with a problem, you still got breath in your body. So we thank God for his goodness. We want to thank the master for the teaching of his word through yes, his servant, Brother, <coughs> Brother Shelley, Amen. who has been bootlegging a message for quite some time. And then we give praise to Amen. Sister Millsap and the praise team. How does everybody feel? How blessed are you? Are you blessed enough to just give him praise without me having to say anything? Amen. At this time, where's Brandon? She's coming to give us our welcome. think we have any announcements other than just be safe. We are very delighted to see the Burstons back in the house. Amen. Amen. Don't know whether it will be cleared up when we get out, but I understand that there's trouble on the interstate, which it ain't like we don't, we're used to, <laughs> used to it, but uh, I understand they've had a, a wreck, so we have some more people stuck in traffic. As they come in, just let them on in the door. Amen? Amen. 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 I am excited um, dealing with where we are to go on today in our teaching of God's Word. Um, I'm excited simply because I think this is an area that all of us as children of God wrestle with. And uh, I do want to be able to make sure that in this foundational text that um, you get this, which will be the foundation so that when we take off from it, we'll be able to understand exactly what it takes to do what our theme is going to present to us. The theme that the Lord has laid on my heart for this next series of messages is entitled, Follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. Before I even go into it, I want to stop right there and let's talk to the master. I'm not going to deal with 
just yet our universal prayer that we have presented on the screen. I just want to talk to him that he might open up our minds and our hearts in a way that we understand what this series is all about. So let's bow our heads. Our Father and our God, we first want to say thank you. You have been mighty good to us. Here we are once again on a Sunday morning in your house. God, when we check the record, death was still on the rampage. So many were called home, and yet here we are, breathing your air in your house, hearing your word, so it's absolutely nothing we've done so outstanding and so great. But we recognize the awesomeness of your amazing grace. So there had to be a reason why you spared us this day. So we come opening up our hearts and our minds that you might pour into us your instruction. We thank you, first of all, for the foundation of your word that has already been taught through life application. Thank you, sir. We ask now that you have your way in us, that when we depart from this place, we would have received a double portion, two shots through your word, that we might be able to do those things that are necessary that will be pleasing in your sight. We want our light to be able to shine so bright that others around us will know that we've been this way. Forgive us now of any shortcomings in our lives. Our goal is to follow you. Not our agenda. Not even our will. But we submit to you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Let every heart say, Amen. Amen. Our theme is follow the Holy Spirit. Our theme text, and make sure in writing down in your notes that you write as I speak. Theme text. That means that the text that I'm going to present to you is going to be the text that we're going to use as the foundational text. However, there will be other passages as we take this journey of what it requires of us to follow the Holy Spirit. Our theme text is found in Romans Chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, the text simply reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. First of all, in looking at our theme text, it is vitally important, it is necessary that we first of all consider the context of that verse so that we will be able to get a clear understanding of exactly what Paul is saying unto us in Romans chapter 8 verse 14. The first thing that I need to establish is some surrounding things about what that verse is born out of. You see, Romans chapter 8 is actually known as the greatest chapter found in the Bible. Let me say that again. Romans chapter 8 has the characteristics, the 
ability to become the greatest chapter found in the Bible. Now, the reason I can make such a statement is simply because of how the chapter ends as well as how it begins. So if you check your notes, it has a unique way in its beginning. When you open up your Bibles and begin to read what chapter 8 has to offer, it starts in a unique manner where Paul talks to us about no condemnation. Everybody listening? That's what you will find in verse 1 of Romans chapter 8. But then look now at how he closes the chapter. He closes the chapter in verse 39 by saying no separation. Everybody hear me? So you open up the chapter and you will find no condemnation. When you end the chapter, he says no separation. One in verse 1 and the other in verse 39. But then Paul doesn't stop there. It's important that you look at what Paul has to offer in the middle of all of that. From verse 1 to 39, in the middle, Paul talks to us and he says, not only do you open it up about no condemnation, okay? Not only will I end in talking to you about no separation, but in the middle, he says, let me plug in no defeat. Now, that's enough to shout off of. Just at the beginning. And the reason why that's important is because it carries with it a powerful message. If you are truly born again, before we even deal with following the Holy Spirit, Paul says, let me remind you that it doesn't matter what folks say about you. There is no condemnation. And then he turns around and he says, I don't really want to deal with how much hell you might be catching. Because there can be no separation from your relationship with the Lord. And then he says, just in case you are troubled, I want to make sure you get this. In the midst of your struggle, there is no defeat. You can't lose with what you got. Now, we can go home now. Now, Romans chapter 8 is actually so unique because Paul climaxes an argument in chapter 8 dealing with, to some theologians, in the area of sanctification. The area of sanctification. This is something that you can challenge your, your knowledge on. Paul begins dealing with this in Romans chapter 6. He continues in chapter 7, and he closes in chapter 8. What makes this whole issue of what Paul is writing about so important is that something quite unusual happens in these chapters. The Holy Spirit dominates Paul's teaching. Now, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit dwelling in Paul. I'm talking about in his writing. That when you take the time to read what Paul talks to, the subject matter, the Holy Spirit dominates all of these chapters. The reason I want us to grasp all of this is because if you lose sight of this foundational text, you might get lost in the process. 
Watch this now. We as Christians can grasp what Paul has to teach us because I'm here today to work on how we let the flesh hinder us. And Paul wants us to know that you can overcome these fleshly desires. Everybody up in here has made mistakes in our relationship with the Lord. Does everybody hear me? I, I don't care who you are. We've all made simple mistakes. That means that we have done some things that we want to blame the Holy Spirit for. And there are some things we didn't do that the Holy Spirit told us to do. All right. All right. Watch this. Chapter 8 of Romans has actually been called the Christian's Declaration of Freedom. Now, let, now, let, let, <laughs> let me go in detail to explain why. This means that we don't have to live a life of bondage. We don't, we don't have to live a life of defeat. What bothers me more than anything is that Christians ought to be full of joy. But we are the deadest, most depressing, acting people. And we can't understand why the club is drawing more people than the church. See, you didn't have no problem when you went to the club because you blended in with what the atmosphere was. Even if you couldn't dance, you did what you could. And you know the saying, don't be no wallflower. So if you just stood there and just shook your leg, you blended in. My question is, why is it in the body of Christ, we got to be pumped up. We, we got to be pushed. We got to be urged. We got to be dragged along the way. Something is wrong somewhere. So in this series, Paul's mission is to take us from listening and obeying the flesh to a level of where we can learn how to follow the Holy Spirit. It has been said in Romans chapter 8 that Paul makes this conclusion. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I want you to hear this. Listen to what he says now. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I, I wanted us to get that because that's one of the major problems in the body of Christ. We are ashamed. Can I use an analogy? And if you don't fit in it, don't worry about it, but I know you'll be lying. I can only deal with me. In my club days, everybody listening? Just like yours, in my club days, I never really enjoyed smoking. I had a problem with inhaling and blowing it back out. And I never wanted to cough because that was a sign you didn't know how to smoke. But that really wasn't my major problem. My major problem was I did not like the idea that when you sat down and you drop ash yeah. off the cigarette yeah. and I looked down at my pants that I had just gotten out the laundry yeah. and they got a spot on there. That just worked my last nerve because I actually burned a hole in a pair of pants in the car from trying to smoke while driving. Now, I'm, I'm saying this because my mission was to blend in with the atmosphere 
of those in the club. Not only that, I uh, wasn't a big liquor drinker, but would drink a beer, but I would hold it. Because I noticed everybody in there were holding a little something. So I did everything that I felt was necessary to blend in so I would fit. I would be a part of. Now that I'm born again, Paul says, number one, I'm not ashamed. I wasn't ashamed when I was in the club. Even when <laughs> they had to tell me every now and then, look, doc, you, you, you need to put your cigarette in the right finger. <laughs> boy, y'all look at See, I, I like that. Boy. You, you, you don't hold it. It, it goes in them two right there. But <laughs> Are, am I making sense? And, and then you will blow your smoke out before you open your mouth to talk. Boy, see, that, those are things I had to learn. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Why is it then that within the body of Christ, we act as if we are ashamed? Let me move on. When we think about it, all of us up in here must first recognize we have come a mighty long ways. Now, I want you to go back to what I asked you to write in your notes. I want to pull blessings just from no condemnation, no separation, and no defeat. How can I prove it? If you start out right, all of us, at one point, we were under condemnation. Now, there is what? No condemnation. First accusation was imperfect justification. We couldn't do nothing right to get it right. Only God could straighten us out. But now... We recognize we are living in perfect justification. Boy, that's amazing. I can't explain how God got me where I am. All I know, I got it. Everybody with me? Thirdly, we are in an age where our mouths were silenced in shame. I can remember being in church and needed peppermint so that the old folk wouldn't smell what I was drinking the night before. Boy, don't y'all sit up in here. But now I got a mouth that I can rejoice over the goodness of the Lord. That's what Paul sets. That's, that's the stage that he sets before us even before we even take tackling our theme text. Everybody got it? Watch this now. When we enter studying this chapter, don't lose sight of those three things. Read and study with the attitude, no condemnation. Then when trouble comes, Read it and understand there's nothing that can happen to me that can separate me from the love of God. Then get real, real happy when the enemy comes before you and say, look, you might hit up on me, but there's no defeat. I'm not going to lose. Everybody got it? See, now I had to say all of that because I don't want you to ignore some things that Paul is saying. You can say no defeat based on what's in the middle because of what Paul says in the chapter. When you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28, please get it. And we know, don't lose sight of that now, and we what? No. See, that's where the problem comes. We can't know because we do nothing to know. Paul says, and we know that all things do what? Work together. For good to those who what? Love God and to those who are what? Called according to his what? 
purpose. Got me? Now, I, I haven't even gotten into the text. I, I'm trying to get us into it, but I don't want to jump into it. I want you to see what surrounds the text. With that in mind, let's look now at the text. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Before we can actually examine and pull this entire text apart, it's vitally important that we understand what Paul means when he makes the statement. I, I don't want you to just read it and take it off the page. Many of us or as confused as others are. Yeah. And let me explain what I'm saying. Many read that verse and take it out of context. All right. All right. Everybody listening? Uh -huh. Now let me share with you my argument so you can better understand it. First of all, I need you to recognize that Paul is not talking about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Does everybody hear me? No. Paul is talking about us allowing ourselves to be led by him. Do you see the difference? In other words, there is no question. There is no, 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 you don't have to figure out. God, the power of the Holy Spirit can lead. Yes, sir. You got me? Yes, sir. But Paul is talking to us about us yielding to him. Yes, See, we, we like to put the blame on him. The only reason I, I, I didn't know, no, can't, 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 you can't go there. He has the ability to lead. He will lead, but you got to submit. You got to surrender. You got to give in. And you can't be dragging your will. The whole house should have jumped up. I want to read how this statement is found in other translations. The one I want to use is the New Catholic Version. And I want you to listen to what that Bible says. Same verse says, The true children of God are those who let God's Spirit lead them. Now you got a whole different connotation. You got a whole different thought. Does everybody understand what it's saying? See, you letting the Holy Spirit lead you. This is not about the Holy Spirit leading. It's about Paul saying, submitting to the Holy Spirit's leadership. Why hear all the word? Why come here and sit? Why take notes? If you're going to go back and still do your thing. Right, right, right. When you don't change, then you are saying in essence, the only way I'm going to change, you got to come to the kitchen table and sit down in front of me. And this and this and this. And if he showed up that way, you are faint. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Romans chapter 8 verse 14. The issue on the table then. Is this statement. Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us? Does everybody hear me? Are you willing? I, I don't know if the Lord would want me to do it. I ain't asked you what the Lord. Don't put it on him. This is dealing with us. Will I allow the Holy Spirit to lead me? Okay? You, you got to get to that point that if you don't think so, you're going to have a problem. 
Because some people have a hard time giving up their will. <sighs> so Romans chapter 8, verse 14, serves as a new subtopic in Paul's writings here in Romans chapter 8. That means at some point in Paul's writing, he stops and pauses and makes this statement. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when we get ready to pull it apart, I'm going to show you that it's powerful, but there's some stuff that Paul mentions about following the Holy Spirit you can't throw away. You got to maintain, you got to hold yourself accountable because Paul got a way of dragging stuff along. Are you with me? Just allow me to read it again. Listen to what he says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the Sons of God. All right. In Romans 8 14, there are two major bullets, two things that Paul plays with in the verse that I'm going to need for you to write down in your notes. That means that we're going to take a look at the verse and arrive at two major things that Paul's going to deal with. You with me? In verse 14a, he's going to talk to us about the guidance of the Spirit. The guidance of the Holy Spirit. You got to see this now. I know what I just told you. I'm trying to make sure you understand that he's going to do his job, but we got to do ours. Then in 14b, we want to deal with the guarantee of sonship. Everybody got it? You got two G's. First, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Then secondly, the guarantee of sonship. Let's talk now about the guidance of the Spirit. I want you to listen now as we pull this theme text apart. Let's watch carefully what Paul says. I don't, I don't, I don't want to jump over nothing. Listen to what he says. He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Stop right there. Stop right there. In order to grasp what Paul is actually trying to show us, I was going to jump over it and then I found something. And it allowed me to understand how Paul writes and how he's thinking. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is one word. Write it in your notes. For. F-O-R. Write it in your notes. For is known as a characteristic word. Does everybody hear me? It is a characteristic word that reminds us of something. And listen to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I am making a transition in what I'm trying to teach to you. But I want you to understand that the thought in verse 14 is so important, it cannot stand by itself. I got to reach back and bring with me what I've already said to you. Yes, sir. All right. you teach. Ah! Yeah. 
Am I making sense? You, you, don't, you don't start out saying, Fa. That means you would have already had to open your mouth and, and make a statement. What Paul is saying is, don't jump at this verse unless first you look at what I've already said. And I just finished telling you in three parts, no condemnation, no separation, and no defeat. So you got the beginning, you got the end, and you got what's in the middle. It actually serves as a necessary link to what Paul has already said. So when you go home, you got homework. When you lead church, read one all the way up to this point. Am I making sense to you? It reminds us then that Paul wants us to recognize a sense of security as believers in Christ. Listen to what I'm saying. Before you talk about trying to follow the Holy Spirit... You need to know you are secure in him. And the devils in hell can snatch. You are secure. And you got to know you are secure. Without a doubt. That's where Paul stands. So first thing you need to have in your notes is Paul begins the verse with the word what? For. Second thing of importance. Secondly, you must take note of the fact of the tense of the statement. Okay? Now, now to some folks, this may not really matter. But I used to teach English uh, years ago, and, and I like tenses. Because tense tells you positions of what happens right now. So here's the phrase I want you to write down. He said, led by the Spirit. Write it down. Led, just led by the Spirit. It is present, passive, indicative. Present, passive, indicative. And it indicates that which already exists. Boy, y'all got to stay with me. Which means that even before I try to recognize mm, that I'm led by the Holy Spirit in a situation, the moment I became saved, his leadership stepped in. I hope, boy, 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 boy. Am I making sense to you? Does, does, does everybody get this? Yeah. See, you could not be in the position you are in if he didn't lead you from an unsaved state to a saved state. So the tense is something that already exists, which means now I don't have to worry about the Holy Spirit's leadership skill. Why? Because I already can holler, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Are, are you with me? Does, it, does everybody? I, 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 this is class. I, I don't want nobody to get lost. So, possessing the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit are two different things. Listen, why I'm saying this now. I'm saying this because when Paul says led by the Holy Spirit, he is not talking about continuous action. Ooh, y'all got quiet. Let, Let me help you out. When we were lost, the Holy Spirit took control and led us from an unsaved state to a saved state. But now that I am saved, 
I am obligated. Not sometimes, but every morning he wakes me up. I must now submit. I must surrender to him and his leadership skill. Which means now, just because you are saved does not mean you are always following the Holy Spirit. Some of us have done some dumb things and put it on the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to be out your hair. Be out your hair. I'm going to be out your hair. I promise you. I promise you. Listen to this. Every true believer possesses the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Don't take out certain things that I said. Every what? True believer. That means then that if there's a true believer, there you go. And you can't move on what folks say. You have to move on what people do. Am I making sense to you? So every true believer possesses the Holy Spirit. Now you might be saying, well, why is the pastor saying all of that? I'm going to take you somewhere, and then I'm going to let you go home. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, listen to Paul. Same chapter. That's why I'm telling you. You can't grab that text and run with it. Listen to what Paul says. But you are not what? In the flesh, but what? In the spirit. Stop right there. That means for him to say that, you got to know what a life in the flesh used to be like. So now he reminds you that since the Holy Spirit has moved you out of an unsaved state into a saved state, you got to be careful now because the only reason you were over here in an unsaved state was because you were being operated by your flesh. That's what got Adam and Eve in trouble was the flesh. And brothers and sisters, you got the same flesh. Oh, but you are not in the flesh, but what? In the spirit. If indeed, watch him now. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Oh, boy, y'all better get this. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not what? His. You don't have to fuss with people who ain't got him. Listen to this statement. Write down the word dwell. Listen to what Paul is saying. The Christian, the Christian, the true Christian, number one, is in the spirit. You got me? Now, all of us up in here, we, we ain't done things perfect. We make mistakes. But you are in the what? Spirit. That's the first thing. Second thing I need you to understand is that Paul in the text uses the word dwells. Did you see it? The Holy Spirit dwells within the Christian. I'm way ahead of where we're going with this thing, but I can't jump over good information. Amen. See, the, the problem with our following him, we don't really understand his dwelling. I had you to write down the word dwell because the word dwell in, to, in the text simply means to be at home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good God from Zion. Boy, did y'all get that. To be where? At home. At home. It is the same word that a husband and wife uses when one says he dwells with me. God Almighty. So I need to ask you a question. Who's at your house? Boy, y'all better... Christians are the house of the Holy Spirit. God meant Christians are the what? House. So how is it possible for you to have him at your house and you don't know he's there? <laughs> it's 
See, I'm old school. Back in the day, old folks you tell you, don't you ever answer the door. Now, we can run back in the back and say, you know, grandma, somebody at the door. But you wouldn't give them permission to answer the door. Now, I said that so that when I bring this portion to a close, you can understand. I don't understand how a Christian can let him in and then act like he ain't in the house. I ain't understood that. Are you with me? And, and y'all know now, back in the day, anybody came in, they, my grandmom used to say, now look, you can dirty up everything. I don't want y'all dirty up nowhere, but if you're going to mess up, you can mess up in the back. But don't you mess up this living room. In fact, they kept the door shut. And I used to think it was a sin to sit on the sofa. Because you couldn't go in. Could, couldn't, go, couldn't go in, couldn't do a thing. Not, not in the living room. No. No. The problem is, if the Christians recognize that their body, they are the very impediment of his presence... How you know he ain't at home? So how is it possible to come to church and sit like a not on law? And you got a guest in your house and you can't even acknowledge the person, that presence. Something wrong somewhere. Oh, I, I knew I wasn't going to get far. I knew I wasn't going to get far. Christians are where at the house of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me end it and prove it on this. Listen to Paul. Listen to Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, listen to what Paul says. He, he got another way of, of, of explaining this idea of the Holy Spirit dwelling. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God, watch that word again, does what? Dwells where? In you. If anyone de what? defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? Now you can't answer that question. Till you define the guest in your house. I got to ask you. Do you know the guest at your house? You understand? Because when he's present, he'll talk to you. And he'll tell you things. He'll sometimes whisper and say, hold your head up. Don't you walk around there acting like I ain't here. Hold your head up. Walk with dignity. And realize you've been bought with a price. Sometimes he'll get down on your level and say, baby, I ain't at everybody's house. But I'm at your house. And you didn't pay a dime to let me come in. In fact, I knocked at your door by grace. Because I want you to know I love you so much. That I was willing to step. Inside your dirty house. I'm finished. I stepped in your house. And let me really hurt your feelings. Your house still ain't as clean as it should be. You still got some dirty rooms up in there. But he says he want me to tell all of us. But I'm still in your house. I'm still in your house. Even when you fall short and you screw up, I'm still. That's the part I get happy on. That I don't have to wake up in the morning worried whether he stepped out the house. See, Sister Wesley, he loved me so much 
that he'll stay in my house and tell me where I messed up. He ain't like some of y'all. Y'all will show up and when you leave, you run your mouth. Oh, but not him. <laughs> Woo! He'll stay there. And that's the only reason I can praise him. Because I don't know nobody else that's treated me like he has. And I got the assurance he's still in the house. Can I tell you why I know? Late in the midnight hour. When you think it's over, I dare you to call on him. All you got to do is just call his name. And he'll leave from whatever area he's in and meet your needs. All because Paul said, for, <laughs> for you Tell you where we're going to go. Next week, next week, next week, next week. We dealt with the tense. We dealt with the word for. I, I want to play with when Paul made the statement, what kind of, what things is he implying when he says such a thing? For as many as are led by the Spirit. What, what is he implying? You need to know that. You got me? How, can, can I ask y'all one more question before I let y'all go home? Who you got at your house? Who is at your house? I used to be a little troubled about his presence until he whispered and said, look, man, open up every door you got. Stop sweeping all your mess under the bed. Just talk to me. And I found out the best way to deal with his presence yes, is to come clean. That's what mess folk up when you get blessed and they can't figure out how. Have you ever come clean? <laughs> all right, all right. Put a pin in there. Put a pin in there. We, we ain't got nowhere. Boy, that... We're going to take our time. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. For as. <laughs> okay. Okay. Doors of church open. Woo. Put a pin there. Put a pin there. You should already know now. You got all the information you need. Got me? For as many as are led. We ain't even crossed over the comma. Because we haven't taken care of what's on the right side of the comma yet. Left side. We're going we gonna to go a little bit further. You may come today as a candidate for baptism, Christian experience, or by letter.